fitting song to what we're going to discuss this morning. We're talking about the origin of the New Testament, and we're looking at John 16. So take your Bibles and open with me to John 16 as we continue our study in this wonderful gospel given to us by the Holy Spirit, written and penned by the Apostle John. We come to a text this morning, verses 12 through 15. John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. The Word of God says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Byblos is an ancient Phoenician port city on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, which is now modern-day Lebanon. According to historians, Byblos was thought to be the oldest of all cities. In fact, in their religion, they said the god El was the god who started that city from the beginning of time, and throughout its history, it remained the religious capital of Phoenicia. That city's primary trade was papyrus. Papyrus is a plant from which they would extract the leaves and the texture of it and make paper. The earliest manuscripts of the New Testament were written on this paper called papyrus. The Greeks actually took the name Byblos from that area and named it and gave it the name book or Byblos or Biblia. That's where we get our name Bible from. Later on, ancient Bibles were made from parchment or sheep or goat skins. It required, it required an entire flock of sheep and the material from them in the 4th century to produce one Bible. The cost of one Bible in the 13th century would be as much as one year's salary of a priest. In 400 AD, the Bible had been translated into 500 languages. By 500 AD, the Bible had been reduced down to one, Latin. It was considered to be the language of the educated people. It wasn't for the common people. And as a result... The church was thrust into the dark ages. And it wasn't until the Reformation that the glorious light of the gospel had been brought forth by the translation of the word of God from Latin eventually into English. And then became, as we all know, Wycliffe and his translations and also his printing press that he worked on. The Bible is clearly one of the most unique books, isn't it? If not the most unique books. Beyond the strange facts that you may not know, which I'll share with you just a couple, it's the most often stolen book in the world. Did you know that? It's also in 17th century, the Bible was published by Robert Baker. Mistakenly, they recorded the seventh commandment as, Thou shalt commit adultery. They had produced a thousand copies before they found it out, and they tried to retract it. Nine copies remain, and they call it the sinner's Bible. The Bible also mentions dogs 42 times, but never mentions house cats. How strange is that? That's not really what makes the Bible unique, though. The Bible is, in fact, in its entirety, clearly claiming to be God's word. Over and over again, it claims to be the very words of the living God. The Bible has 66 individual books in it. It was written over 1,600 years by 40-plus authors. Those authors come from diverse backgrounds, such as kings, priests, physicians, fishermen, shepherds, theologians, statesmen, tax collectors, soldiers, scribes, and farmers, yet it contains no errors. And it is completely consistent from beginning to end with a theme and a story that it is promoting and teaching. Every time the Bible speaks... And this is every time the Bible speaks. Scientifically, it is true. Every time the Bible speaks historically, it is accurate. Every time the Bible refers to something that archaeological finds produce, it is true. The Bible is the most read, studied, scrutinized, dissected, analyzed, debated, refused, rejected, scorned, loved, treasured, and died for books in all of history. It has more books written about it than any other book. 
There have been more schools and hospitals created because of it. It has transformed and changed, genuinely changed more lives than any other book penned by man. And if you read it hundreds of times, and many of you know this, if you read it hundreds of times, you never are able to plumb the depths of it. If you study it your whole life, you never can fully understand it. To date, we have 5,800 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament with an astounding 2.6 million pages of biblical text. And while some of these manuscripts are very small fragments, the majority of them are very large. In fact, most of them are 450 pages long. Add to that the all, all the other copies of manuscripts that are recorded in Latin, Coptic, Syriac, and Armenian, and other languages. We literally have tens of thousands of copies of the New Testament. And do you realize that there's an embarrassment, as Daniel Wallace says, there's an embarrassment of riches regarding the New Testament. No other ancient text, no other historical document can compare to the New Testament when it comes to the sheer volume of manuscripts that we have to support the New Testament. According to Strong's Concordance, God is mentioned 4,473 times. Jesus is mentioned 973 times. Times. This book is authored by God for God to reveal Himself as God to those who do not know God. That's the Bible that you hold in your hands, that you read daily. As we come to our text this morning, we are going to find out the origin of this book, more particularly the origin of the New Testament. We're not talking primarily about the Old Testament because by the time Jesus is with His disciples, there was literally no debate as to what the Old Testament books were. They were assumed as authoritative. They were assumed as God's word. There was no critical theory being produced out there that said this is not the word of God. They believed it, accepted it, trusted it to be the very words of the living God. When Jesus gives these words in John 16, the New Testament has not been written. John later on would write the book called the Gospel of John and then write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. But many of the other New Testament books by that time had not been written either. So we come to the text, and let's look at it together. This is a most fascinating text given to us here. We're going to be jumping around in it and looking at parts of it, not so much chronologically as we are just trying to understand what the text means. And to begin with, we're going to look at the setting for the New Testament. There are four points we're going to look at, the setting, the origin, the content, and the authority. The first two will be slower than the second two, just to give you a heads up, so you know once we make it halfway through, we're good. But to begin with, let's look at the setting for the Bible. Look at verse 12. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, that may not seem to be that complicated of a phrase, but it's really profound in many ways because Jesus had been talking to his disciples for some time now. Remember, all the way back in chapter 13, we enter into the upper room with the Lord and his disciples, and we're there to see the washing of the feet, the establishment of the new covenant, and the Lord's Supper and then, of course, Jesus gives them instruction about his departure. He's going to leave. They go into complete despair. He gives them comfort, right? He tells them that they are going to be the very spokesmen for God in the future, but the world's going to hate you and kill you. But then he begins to tell them that I have a whole lot more information I need to share with you. In fact, the word translated here, many, comes from the Greek word palus, and it means high in number, plenteous, great in amount. In fact, it is also a present tense verb, meaning that he has much to say on an ongoing basis. We would expect it to be present tense because he's not saying something one time. He's speaking on a continual basis. But you put the word many and then the present tense verbs together, and you get the idea that it would indicate a long, protracted speech. But we know from the text that this is not going to happen. This is going to end very soon. Jesus is going to be eventually arrested. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be buried rise from the dead, then he's going to be taken back up into heaven. So all that information that he has for his disciples has to come another way, a different way. He's told them already that he's going to send another helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And he would come alongside of them and teach them and instruct them and comfort them and encourage them. But Jesus says, I have a lot more to say to you. Very important phrase that Jesus says, I have a lot more to say to you. Deuteronomy 18, 
The Old Testament prophesied of this prophet that would come on the scene. It said this, and I quote, I will raise up from them a prophet like you from among the brethren. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear, hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. And Hebrews, like, like Chris had shared a couple of weeks ago here in our church, Hebrews chapter 1, where it says, God at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophet, has in these last days, what? Spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 tells us that there's a great salvation that was first begun to be spoken of by our Lord. John 1.1, 1, 1, you remember that many years ago when we started the Gospel of John? Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word Word is chosen for a particular reason. The Greek word logos means the revelation of God. Jesus is the revelation of God to man. It gets even more specific in John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, the only unique Son, Jesus Christ, has declared him. That's the word exegete. In other words, Jesus Christ is an expositional sermon of God. That's what Jesus is. But he noticed what Jesus says in the text here. He says, I have many things to say to you, verse 12 now, but you cannot bear them now, he says. The word bear here is the word that means to bear up or to accept, to receive. It had the idea of carrying a great weight or a great load. It's used that way in Acts 15.10 where it says, Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither the fathers nor they were able to bear, carrying up a heavy load? Matthew 8.17 is used this way that uh, the prophet Isaiah had spoken, said this regarding Christ. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The idea of bear there is to carry a great weight, a great load. And so what Jesus is saying is this. Listen, guys, I would like to tell you a whole lot more information, but you can't handle the weight of it. And I think there's more going on there than just the amount of information. It's the depth of the information. Because what Jesus can tell them, what we will see revealed in the New Testament, is a whole lot more depth than you even get in the Old Testament. The sensitivity that Christ has, I believe, is most amazing here. Here are these men who have been told already that Jesus is leaving and that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to comfort them and help them and teach them. But then he also tells them, listen, I have a whole lot more I want to give to you, but you can't handle it now. He understood that there was a need for spiritual growth. These men were not fully matured in their faith yet. They were growing in their faith, but they were not anywhere near where they would eventually end up. And spiritual growth is not an event. It's a process. And everybody, like in this room, is at a different level in their spiritual growth. Some of you are babes in Christ. Some of you are more mature in Christ. Some of you are like young men in Christ or young women in Christ. You grow at different levels. A lot of it depends on how much you eat and feed upon the Word and study the Scripture and apply it in your life. Here in this text, he reminds us that these here disciples were not ready yet to receive it. Paul the Apostle talked about this in a different way. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but unto you as carnal, as babes in Christ. And what he's basically saying there, there is a level, an entry level, if you will, of spiritual life that we call babes in Christ. They were sinful, but he's saying, listen, you're acting like someone who doesn't have very good discernment in the word of God and hasn't dealt with the sin issues in your life. So he calls them fleshly. First Peter 2.2, 2, Peter refers to them this way. He calls those new Christians as newborn babes. He says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Hebrews even says it this way in chapter 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So scripture is clear that this is an ongoing process, right? In fact, the way God set the church up indicates this. In Ephesians 4.11, Paul says this, that God gave to the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting, maturing, equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, for what reason? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, 
to become a perfect, complete man, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. In other words, there is a place in your life at the beginning of your Christianity that you are called a babe in Christ. And you and I need to grow. Jesus was literally sensitive to these disciples who had been with him for three years. But listen, they had a lot more to learn. A lot more information they needed to gather together. And what was it that they could not bear? Well, what was it they could not handle? The New Testament. They couldn't handle the New Testament. They weren't ready for it. The New Testament consists of 260 chapters or 7,959 verses or roughly 184,600 words, and they weren't ready for it. They weren't ready for it. It had much more information than they could handle at that time. I mean, these are pre-crucifixion words, right? When Jesus says this to his disciples, this is before the death of Christ. They don't get the basics yet. And so whenever Jesus ascends back to heaven and God begins to give to his church the New Testament, then things begin to open up. What were some of those things? Well, obviously they would be the institution of the new covenant, the spread of the gospel, the growth of the church in the world. It would be those things regarding the the growth of the church, the salvation of souls. These Galilean fishermen who had been appointed as apostles to the church were going to be the very foundation of the church. They were going to be the instruments that the Holy Spirit would use to write down the New Testament that you and I have. That would have been literally overwhelming to you. To already know that your master is leaving and, oh, by the way, you're going to be responsible for writing down the next covenant. You're going to write down all the information. And it's going to be 100% accurate. And it's going to discuss every major doctrine. And by the way, we're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff that's going to go on in the future that you have no idea about. Well, that's going to be way too much information for them at this time. The Holy Spirit had not yet indwelt them. That would happen at Pentecost. They were already a bunch of emotional wrecks. They were messed up. Some of them were depressed. I mean, they had been told what they were going to do and then that someone was going to betray Jesus in the midst of them. And then one of the most trusted men in the group walked out. To do the deed, the evil deed. And they were told that Jesus was leaving and going back to heaven and they were going to be left there and they would eventually be killed. So it wasn't the best of time to give a theological treaty on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That would need to be some time. And God would have to give the word of God over time through the apostles, through the disciples, to the church. So that's the setting of the Bible. And then we move to the second point now, the origin of the Bible, or the origin of the New Testament more particularly. Verse 13 now, we pick it up there. There's a number of phrases here in the next few verses we want to pick up on. Let me just read through them and notice these with with me as I emphasize them. In verse 13, however, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. And he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So in that text, five things are mentioned. He will guide you into all truth. He will speak what he hears. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Christ and he will declare what is mine. Or what is Christ. All of these, by the way, indicate intelligent words. They indicate direct involvement of the Holy Spirit in communicating intelligent language, information. And I think that's very important for you to understand because whenever you talk about the giving of the New Testament, God did not give a bunch of feelings. He didn't give everybody a bunch of experiences and goosebumps. He gave words. That's why you have a book. You have something that you can read, that you can dissect, that you can understand the language in it. God can communicate himself and all of his revelation that he intends for his church through words. Yet more and more today, people are divorcing themselves from the written word for an experience, aren't they? They want to feel something. And believe me, if you read the word of God enough and you spend time in it enough, you'll feel something called conviction 
You'll feel remorse for your sin. You'll feel the need to praise and exalt the holy and righteous God. The words that are used like speak, laleo, we get the word la 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 from it. And uh, some classical Greek writers refer to it as just basically chattering. But in the New Testament, in Koine Greek, it became a dignified word to speak words, to give words that you could understand. Then you have the second word that is used that is a word translated in my text here, tell or declare. Both are the same word in the Greek. And the word basically means to announce, to make clearly or to clarify a thought would be another way of saying that. This word that's translated here, anangelo, is a word that is used for tell or declare. It means to inform someone of someone else's message. So you get the hint there that this is referring to the Holy Spirit bringing a message from where? From heaven. That's where it's coming from. In the secular sense, it was used to refer to the declaration or the proclamation of a king. It also had the idea of even the reports of envoys or unconcealed messages of sorrow were used by that word. In the Septuagint, many, many times, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that word is used to refer to the Lord declares. Over and over and over again, it's referring to the Lord declares that he alone is the true God against the false gods who don't know the future. That's the way that word is used. And so here you have it referring to Jesus Christ will declare to them the words of God. It's used over in 1 John 1, 5, where it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. What? That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And what is meant by this is basically this very important point. It's highly theological, but it's very important. The Bible teaches what is called verbal plenary inspiration. And what I mean by that is that every word is inspired, okay, and all of the words are inherently authoritative because they're the, they're the word of God. That's what verbal plenary means. All parts, every part, every word is inspired by God. Now, whenever we say that, to make sure I'm clear on this, we're not talking about translations. We're talking about the original manuscripts. Because you know, if anybody knows there's so many translations out there of the New Testament, and some of them are better than others, right? You have some that really need to be removed from all public domain. And then you have some that are better than others as far as getting the Greek right and translating it correctly. But whenever we talk about the inspiration of the New Testament, we're talking about the original manuscripts that Paul wrote, that John wrote, that Peter wrote, that others of the New Testament wrote, those are the ones that are inspired. And they're inspired in every single word, every noun, every verb, every preposition, every single word. And all parts are inspired. There was a liberal thought that was around for some time that said what God did is this. He inspired the thoughts of men. And then they wrote down the words. Or God gave them experiences and then they interpreted those experiences and wrote down the New Testament. But that's actually not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that every single word is inspired of God. Now, this is not robotic either. This is not that the Spirit of God came along and grabbed Paul or grabbed John and said, Now, you listen here. You're going to sit down here, and I'm going to give you word after word after word, and you're going to write it down. No, God used men, even imperfect men like Peter, John, and Paul, to write down the New Testament. He used their background, their vocabulary, their education, their experiences, and through that process was able to write down the very words that God wanted to communicate to us in the New Testament. So when we talk about God's message being declared, we're talking about every single word and all parts of it being authoritative. These are specific, uh, excuse me, specific and intentional words. You remember this verse? I know you know it well. Matthew 5, 17. Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. He says, I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. But assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. What did he mean by that? Well, when he says this, that heaven and earth would pass away before one jot or tittle passes away, the word jot is the Hebrew equivalent of the Old Testament letter, the Yod. It's the smallest little letter. It looks like an apostrophe. That's what it looks like. Very small in the Hebrew text. And then there were the tittles. And what's a tittle? 
A tittle is basically a little slash on a Hebrew letter that made the difference between a C and a B. And it would be like the difference between our E and our C. The little middle slash in our E would be the tittle. And so you literally could move one of those tittles and you could end up with a different letter or a different word. And the Bible's telling us, listen, this is how specific it is. Jesus says all of heaven, all of earth will pass away, but not one letter and not one part of a letter will pass away till all of it is fulfilled. You say, how is it that God can do that? Well, <laughs> he's God. Pretty much settles that, right? I think he can take care of that. If he can write a book over 1,600 years with 40-plus different authors, he can clearly preserve it and take care of it. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that he is going to protect his words and that he inspires his words. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, individual words, will by no means pass away. Psalm 89, 3, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word which has gone forth from my lip. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. I like what Peter says in chapter 1, verse 25, but the word, singular, the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word we're talking about, the New Testament. Notice also, look back at verse 13 now in John John 16, 13, he says this, however, when he, and who's the he? The he is the spirit of truth, right? Indicated there in the text. And I, I think I pointed this out when we were in chapter 15, that that same construction is used. The Greek word is a kinos. It means that one. You could literally read it this way. However, when that one, what one? The spirit of truth, the one that's coming. He's the one that is coming, and he will, notice this, guide you into all truth. Notice there, he's the spirit of truth, right? And he's also going to guide you into all truth. He's called the spirit of truth. He will guide you into truth. He's not going to guide you into experiences or feelings or subjective things. He's going to guide you into objective truth. He communicates absolutes, concrete ideas, concrete words. For a moment, hold your place there and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to show you something that will illustrate this in a most profound way. All of those of you who have uh, read the New Testament and you're familiar with the life of the Apostle Peter, you know that Peter was a very emotional guy. I mean, sometimes he would go way ahead of himself and get himself in a mess, but nevertheless, he was a guy that loved to be around the Lord. He was a little extravagant. Sometimes he would speak before he thought. Things like that. But he was also one of the apostles or one of the disciples that was taken up into the mountain of transfiguration. You remember that? Peter, James, and John. And Jesus took them up into this mountain that he later calls the holy mountain. And Jesus was literally transfigured before their very eyes. And the glory of Christ was shown forth. You remember that? He saw second coming glory is what he mentions in this text. And in that context, Peter responded and said, hey, this is great. Let's just build three tabernacles right here because Moses and Elijah showed up also. And we'll just stay here. That was Peter. Peter had a great experience. In fact, if he was on Christian TV, he would have been running the circuits. He would have been one of the most profound speakers on the circuit of churches to speak about, I have seen God and I've experienced God. But when it comes to something that he wants to depend upon for his faith, Something that he wants to rest upon that will keep him straight. He doesn't go to that. He goes to the word of God. The written, revealed word of God. So let's begin here in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. He says in this text, For this reason I will not, excuse me, let me reread that again. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you have known them and established in the present truth. Now verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Now, what he's talking about is the truth that he gave in the earlier book and also the earlier chapter. He says, I'm going to remind you of the truth, not the experience, the truth. Second Peter chapter 1, now verse 16. 
For he says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Now, the word cunningly devised is the Greek word sophizo. We get sophia, the word wisdom from it. And he basically has the idea of very wise, and the next word is fables or mythos, myths. Very wisely constructed myths. Don't you see that today? Don't we have people who come up with some really brilliant ideas that are supposedly wise and human eyes? I mean, they look really profound and deep and mysterious, yet basically they're stupid, right? They don't find themselves resting in the Word of God. They are myths. They're myths, but they seem wise to humanity. And so Paul says, listen, or rather Peter, he says, we did not follow this kind of stuff. He says in the same text, in verse 16, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came from him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. Peter's recounting this Mount of Transfiguration experience. He said, I had a really great experience there. And I've told you about this, but he says, that's not what I depend upon. That's not what I trust in. Verse 19 says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Or another way of rendering that is this. We have a more sure word of prophecy. The literal rendering of that Greek word for Greek word would be this. We continually have a more sure, dependable, prophetic word. Well, what word is that? Well, the word is obviously what he tells us in the next few verses, that word that the Spirit of God caused as he moved upon the men of God to produce the word of God, the New Testament. That's what he's talking about. The word translated in my English text in verse 19, the prophetic word confirmed. The Greek word, babaios, is the Greek. It actually has um, comes from a root word, bino. It means to Walk on solid ground. That's what that means. To walk on solid ground, it means to be firm, unshakable, dependable. So it's saying that that prophetic word that we have in our hands, the Bible, is much more dependable. It is literally walking on solid ground. It's a sure foundation, an absolute foundation. Look at verse 20 now. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now that's not really the best rendering of that. It doesn't really help us to understand what he's saying there. So let me just break it down for a moment. He's saying that any prophecy of scripture, which is a prophetic utterance of scripture, that simply means another way of saying that the word of God that was given by the Holy Spirit that was written down, whether it was spoken by Paul and then written, because oftentimes he would have someone writing what he had to say, or Peter or John or any of the others, as far as that is concerned, he says, we know this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation the word private is the word idios it's the idea of something peculiarly someone's or someone's own stuff if you will peculiar to one particular person we use the word ideology we get that from it it's an emphatic adjective meaning that listen this is not of some private person's opinion that's the idea they didn't come up with it on their own. They didn't get educated in some school and say, look, I'll make this up. This is my idea. It's not that way. It's not private. It's not original to them. And he uses the word interpretation. It's the actual Greek word that means to let loose or to unpack. It's the end of interpretation that whenever you interpret the scripture, you unpack the scripture. But the idea is that whenever the, the Spirit of God gave the word of God through the disciples, he literally did not give them something that they came up with their own, but he was involved in this, giving and unpacking, listen to this, the very literal words of God to them. It's just most amazing how particular the text is on this. He goes on in verse 21 and says, the prophecy never came by the will of man. They didn't sit down one day and say, you know what? Time to write the book of James. It wasn't like that. They were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit moved in and through them and enabled them to write down the very words that God intended for us to have here in our text that we read here this morning. Another way of saying that is 2 Timothy. I just read that earlier in our scripture reading. 2 Timothy 3.16 most of us know this by heart. All scripture is what? 
given by the inspiration of God. It basically says it this way, all scripture, God breathed. The word translated God breathed or inspiration of God, theonoustos, is the word that means the very breath of God. Behind that verb or behind that word is the idea that you're literally in the face of God and feeling the very breath of God. Whenever you read the word of God, you're not getting something that man made up. You're getting the very breath of God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? And he doesn't say some scripture is the very breath of God. He says all scripture is the very breath of God. The scriptures, the Greek word graphe, it means writings. The previous verse, verse 15, says holy writings. He's talking about the Old Testament then as he writes down the New Testament. Later, it clearly became affirmed in the rest of the New Testament by the apostles themselves that what they were writing was indeed the very words of God. He says all scripture is the very breath of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction. He says in verse uh, 2 of chapter 4, he says, preach the word. What word? The word of what? God, right? The very breath of God. That's why it is the responsibility of any preacher, if he's in the pastorate, his primary responsibility is to preach the word of God, not his word, not his opinion. You don't get your sermon from Reader's Digest or People Magazine, right? You get it from the word of God. You get it from the word of God. And that's where the sound doctrine comes from and the teaching comes from. Frankly, folks, you don't want to have, you don't want to hear anything I have to say other than the word of God because I have no opinion that's original. Nothing. I really, I don't. I can't tell you anything that you can't learn on your own, but I can tell you what God's word says. And that's where the authority comes. It comes from God's word. It is his authority. Now we go back to John 16. John 16 again says, however, when he, that is the spirit of God, which is called here the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. This is a very, very beautiful image that is given to us in the New Testament of how the spirit of God will do this. This Greek word that is translated to guide is made up of two words, the word odos or hodas and the word hegeomai that means to lead in the way. And you see it used a number of times in the New Testament and used in the Old Testament. Six times in the New Testament it is used. In the Old Testament, it has the idea of God leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and leading them by the pillar, uh, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. That's the leading that he's talking about or the, the guiding that the Spirit of God is going to do here. It's used that way in the Old Testament of God. But also in rabbinic writings, it's even used of how angels would guide men in their actions. When you come to the New Testament, you find it used this way. Like, for instance, in Matthew chapter 15 and Luke chapter 6, it's used of the blind leading the blind. There's the word lead or guide. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 16, it's used of Judas guiding the authorities to Jesus at night to arrest him. And then you get to Acts chapter 8, and you you begin to get the flavor of this word In Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, and Philip ran to him, the Ethiopian eunuch, and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And Philip said to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me, there's the word, to guide, to lead into the truth. It's also used in Revelation 7, 17, when it says the lamb, Jesus Christ, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd and lead them to living waters. Primarily, as you see how the word is used in the Old and the New Testament, it's the idea of guiding or leading someone to truth that normally would not find it otherwise. That's the point. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you places you've never been before, and you never could get there without him. He's going to take you out of darkness and lead you into light. He's going to take you from error and false religion into the truth. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. There's a passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you can turn there quickly. Keep you turning this morning. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6 and following. The Apostle Paul talks about this very ministry. And I think it's important for us to recognize, we've talked this before and said this before, that the Spirit of God is absolutely essential in the work that you do in a local assembly or in a church or in your Christian life. You and I cannot understand Scripture, nor can we apply it apart from His work. The very beginning of your Christian life starts with the work of the Spirit. It starts with that. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, Paul reminds us of this. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, 
the hidden wisdom of God, which is ordained before the ages for his glory. What is he talking about? He's talking about the New Testament, the mystery that was hidden in the past that is now revealed and made known. He says, that's the wisdom I declare to you, not the wisdom of men, not the wisdom of the Athenian philosophers, not the wisdom of those who are schooled in the best of schools. He says, I'm giving to you the wisdom that was hidden in the past and now is revealed here in the New Covenant, the New Testament. In verse 8, he says, uh, let me back up and reread verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, if it stopped right there, you'd have an idea. You wouldn't know what's coming, right? Read the next verse. Listen to what it says. But... God has revealed them to us through his spirit. How'd you get it, folks? Did you get it because you got in your closet and it was dark and you had a dream? Is that how you got it? How'd you get it? Did you eat something? Something happened in your stomach? Made you feel like you got some kind of revelation from God? Is that how you got it? No, you got it because you read the word of the living God. You want to know what's coming? Read scripture. You see the nonsense going on in our country? If you're a believer, you read the Bible, you say... Saw that coming. Not a shock. That's biblical anthropology. You're seeing it expressed. That's the depravity of man with no restraints. It's biblical. It's clear. You read scripture, you're not surprised by any of this at all. For the Bible goes on and says now in verse 10, For God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. You want to know God? If you've got the Spirit of God through salvation and read the Word of God, you're going to know the deep things of God. And then it says in verse 11, For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man that is in him? That's true, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know what's in your heart. You know. You know what you're thinking. And God's Spirit knows the thoughts of God. And if you want to know what God thinks about something, look at what His Spirit wrote. Right? What did His Spirit write? That's what you have in the New Testament. You have exactly what God's words are, God's thoughts. You want to know what God thinks? Read the New Testament. Verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Verse 13, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's what the Reformers used to call antilogus scriptura, comparing the Bible verses with Bible verses. How do you know God's word? Like I told you a while back when I introduced this text to us, it's 40 authors written over a period of 1,600 years, yet there's an absolute consistency in the theme all the way through. That's why you can compare James with another book in the Old Testament or Hebrews with Leviticus or Revelation with Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel. Why? Because it's all one author. It's all one author. God wrote it all. But he does remind us in verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Lost people don't get it. They don't understand it. They can't understand what we are so excited about regarding the Word of God. They don't understand it. They can't discern it. Now let's go back to John. I promise you we will finish this soon. The last two points will come quick. Verse 13 now, he says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, I know that I'm picking this text apart, but I want you to understand exactly what he means by these words. He did not tell us that he was going to guide us into some truth, did he? He did not say that he was going to guide us into part of the truth. He said he was going to guide us into all the truth. Well, what truth is he talking about? Context indicates that he's talking about the New Covenant, the New Testament, that which the the, the men that we are talking about here, the apostles, would write down all the truth. Now, this is an important thought. Listen to me carefully. God gave all the truth that he intended to give. He is not giving anymore. All right? When he wrote the book, Genesis to Revelation, it starts like this. In the beginning, which is the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 1, chapter 1 of Genesis. You go all the way through the Bible, get all the way to the end, and it says, even so, come Lord Jesus. And we're looking at the end of all things. 
And it's amazing that in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, it says, don't you add one word to this. You get to the book of Revelation, he says, don't you add one word to this. Why? Because it's the word of God, and you better not tamper with it. So all these people claiming to have words from God today, I ask you a question. What book do we put it in? Which one? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where does it go, right? Well, you say, well, it's not quite as authoritative as the Old or the New Testament. Well, then it's not God's word. If someone's going to tell me that God told them that I need to go buy a Toyota and not a Honda, am I supposed to believe that that's the word of God? Am I supposed to believe that that carries the same weight of Scripture? And if it doesn't, then why are you saying that it does, right? Scripture is very, very clear. I mean, listen to this. Absolutely clear that this is it. God gave us all that we can handle. And yet I have found nobody who claims to have multiple cases of God giving them revelation that have yet to dissert, dissect, discern, and understand all of this book. They're out there looking for something more when God gave them more than they can handle now. Right? Well, much more I could say about that. But let me take you to a text quickly to address this. That's in Jude verse 3. The book of Jude, verse 3. There's only one chapter, so we just say verse 3. And this tells us very emphatically so that Scripture has been made complete. All of Scripture. We have all that God intended for us. This is Jude verse 3. Beloved, he says, While I was very diligent to write to you concerning the common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The word contend there is the Greek word that means to agonize. It's actually a strong compound verb. And as one lexicon said, is the strongest possible words you could come up with to contend for, to fight for, to agonize for, to reach the point of total exhaustion for the word of God. You contend for what? The once for all delivered to the saints, faith. That's what you're contending for. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Bible, the written word of God. He says this is the once and for all delivered. You see that word once and for all? If your translation says once and for all, that's accurate. That's the way you should translate the word hapox here. Once and for all. It's used over in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 through 28 three times. Like for instance, listen to these words. He then would have suffered, he then would have to have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away the sins by the sacrifice of himself. For it is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment so christ was offered once to bear the sins of many and the word hapox is used there once and for all it's complete it's done the word translated delivered in our text is the word paradinomy it's a unique word because it means to come from a close to come from close beside someone to be delivered from something close to but it's an aorist passive verb which means this listen to this it was delivered once it was delivered in the past, and it was delivered by God. That's what that means. God delivered it. He delivered it once and for all. He's not constantly delivering it. There is, listen, there's not going to be a revised version of the New Testament pop up from God somewhere. This is it. You have all that God intended you to have, and I just would encourage you to read what you already have. The word faith that is translated here doesn't refer to the act of believing it refers to the content of the revelation. It uses the, the definite article in front of it, the faith. Not the act of believing, not just having faith in God, but the actual content upon which we believe. Whenever we say, you know, our faith says this, then we talk about a statement of faith, what we believe, what we confess. As one commentator, an exegetical commentator, made this note, he says, Regarding this word faith, he says, pistis, in defense of which men are to contend for. It is a body of doctrine. It is practical. It is a fixed and unalterable. It is that which all Christians depend upon. It is your most holy faith. It is the foundation upon which the readers are to build themselves up. So he goes on to affirm the reality that what Jude is referring to here is the actual content of the revelation. So he's telling us that this faith was once and for all. Another way of saying that is this. God delivered the whole of the word of God at one time, obviously through the ages, but he's completed it. It's done. 
It's over. There's no more that you need. Now let's go back to John. Now the next two points come really rapid, okay? Hang tight. So you have the setting of the Bible, the origin of the Bible, now the content of the Bible. The content is so clear in this text, you can't miss it. Verse 13 says he's going to deliver all truth, right? Truth. He also says that he's going to deliver that which was spoken, what God spoke. He also says that he's going to give things to come. But notice the way he indicates this, and this is such an important truth. He says he's going to take what is his and declare it to you. But then in verse 15 he says, All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. You have the entire trinity wrapped up in this process. What the Father says, he gives to the Son. What the Son has, he gives to the Spirit. And there's nothing lost in the midst of any of that. And by the way... If there's any error in that, you would have to ask the question, who made the mistake? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? And none of them make any mistakes. They're perfect. You remember what Jesus said, everything that he said. He says this so many times. I don't have time to repeat all the verses. They're in the notes if you want to go back and look at them. But multiple times, the Bible tells us that Jesus says, my doctrine is not mine, it came from the Father. What the Father told me, I tell you. What came from heaven, I tell you, I command you. Everything Jesus said came directly from the Father in heaven. But then Jesus goes on and tells us that whatever he says that came from the Father is going to come to the Spirit and then is going to be given to these men to write it down for us. The most profound truth that what you have here is a reality that what is given to us, the content, is the very words of the living God. They're broken down in this text in three areas, whatever he hears, things to come, and whatever glorifies Christ. That makes up what the New Testament is. Another way of saying that is, if you were to break it down this way, whatever he hears is the summation of the entire New Testament. What the Father gave to the Son and through the Spirit is What the Lord himself heard from the Father, it is the New Testament. And then secondly, things to come. Well, that obviously refers to what? Prophetic passages. And there are many of them in the New Testament. You have Matthew 23, 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, Acts 1, Romans 8, Romans 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, chapter 4, chapter 5, 1 Timothy 2. Chapter 4, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and on and on. And then the whole book of Revelation. All of that, Jesus says, I'm going to tell you what is coming. By the way, that was what distinguished God of the Old Testament from the false gods. They could never forecast the future at all. They never could get it right. But God always gets it right. He never misses at all. Now, we may interpret it wrong, but he never misses at all. And then the other thing that is so important for you to understand as we close this out this morning, what glorifies Christ is what's going to be written down. The entire New Testament, listen to this, is about glorifying Jesus Christ. Like for instance, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what are they about? (laughs) Jesus Christ, right? You go to the book of Acts, what's that about? The early branching out of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? The proclamation of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, You come to Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and the rest of the New Testament, the epistles they call them. What is that about? The doctrine of Jesus Christ. You go to the book of Revelation, what is that about? The glorious return of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. By the way, not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament too. John 5, 39, Jesus said this, you need to search the scriptures because they are that which testify of me. And he was talking about the Old Testament then. In Luke 24, 27, you remember this? It says, at the beginning of Moses, as Jesus met the men on the Emmaus Road, you remember this? Jesus began to expound from the scriptures all that pertained to him. It's amazing. So you have the setting, the origin, the content, and the last, the authority. The authority of the Bible. Look at it again in this passage, verse 13 through 15. Whatever he hears from the Father, he will share with the Holy Spirit and communicate to the Son. He says in verse 14, the end of the verse, 
take what is mine and declare it to you. Verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. And the point is this, the Father, the Son, and not just the Spirit, but the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all involved in this. And with that comes the authority of God himself. If you notice up in verse uh, 13, it says, for he will not speak on his own. Now, in the New King James, the word authority there is in italics, which means it's not in the original text, and it's not there. But what is there is that he will not speak on his own. That's the translation of two Greek words, from himself. And the idea is this, the Spirit of God is not going to come and speak on his behalf of himself only. He's literally going to repeat what the Father gave to the Son. It's absolute unity in the Trinity. An absolute a declaration of authority. He will come. The New American Standard says he will not speak on his own initiative, of his own will, if you will, apart from the Father or the Son. As I told you in first, rather, Second Timothy 3, this is the very words of the living God, the very breath of God. That carries the weight of authority. These words were to be used by Titus and Timothy to speak to the church. And he says in Titus 2.15, speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority. And then Matthew 7, 29, Jesus taught, it says, as one having authority. Jeremiah 23, 29, you need to remember these words. The Bible says, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? Then he says this, and like a hammer that breaks into pieces. That's the authority of God's word. It carries the weight of the eternal, sovereign God. In April 20th, 1996, there was a declaration that was written by a number of very profound and prominent evangelical leaders. It's called the Cambridge Declaration. In that declaration, their attempt was to return the church back to its foundation, basically to take the church back to the solas of the Reformation. At the very beginning of that, it said this, and I quote, Evangelical churches today are increasingly dominated by the spirit of this age rather than the spirit of Christ. As evangelicals, we call ourselves to repent of this sin and to recover the historic Christian faith. In the course of history, words change. In our day, this has happened to the word evangelical. In the past, it served as a bond of unity between Christians from a wide diversity of church traditions. Historic evangelicalism was confessional. It embraced the essential truths of Christianity as those were defined in the great ecumenical councils of the church. In addition, evangelicals also shared a common heritage in the solas of the 16th century Protestant Reformation. Today, it goes on to say, the light of the Reformation has been significantly dimmed. Now that was in 1996. He goes on to say, says the consequence of this is that the word evangelical has become so inclusive as to have lost its very meaning. We face the peril of losing the unity it has taken centuries to achieve. Because of this crisis and because of our love for Christ and his gospel and his church, we endeavor to assert anew our commitment to the central truths of the Reformation and of its historic evangelicalism. These truths we affirm not because of their role in our traditions, but because we believe that they are central to the Bible. And what was it that they affirmed? Well, I'm only going to read one. And this is the first thesis, Sola Scriptura. Listen to what they say. We reaffirm the inerrant scripture to be the sole source of written divine revelation, which alone can bind the conscience. The Bible alone teaches all that is necessary for our salvation from sin, and it is the standard by which all Christian behavior must be measured. We deny that any creed, council, or individual may bind a Christian conscience. That the Holy Spirit speaks independently or contrary to what is set forth in the Bible. Or that personal spiritual experience can ever be a vehicle of revelation. Martin Luther dealt with that on a different level at his day. In that time, he dealt with the formal principle, which we call the authority of the Word of God. And in 1521, in his historic interrogation before the Roman Catholic Church at the Diet of Worms, he said this. My conscience is held captive to the word of God. One last confession that I love to read, the Belgic Confession, state these words. We believe that the Holy Scriptures 
fully contain the will of God and that whatsoever man ought to believe unto salvation is sufficiently taught therein. Neither may we consider any writings of men, however holy these men may have been, of equal value with these divine scriptures, nor ought we to consider custom or the great multitude or antiquity or succession of times and purses or councils or decrees or statutes as equal value with the truth of God. Therefore, we reject with all our hearts whatsoever does not agree with this infallible rule. And amen to that. And so be it. We have our New Testament. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this, a privilege to be able to come together, to hear again the truthfulness of the word of God. We thank you for the grace that is given to us, these written words. Lord, as we study even these this morning, these were written by the power of the Holy Spirit as he moved upon these men to write down the words of God. I pray, Father, that we would take these words serious that we would read these words, memorize these words, study these words, and live these words. And Lord God, for today, that if there is someone here who's never trusted Christ, may you open their heart to the truth of what we talked about this morning. Jesus Christ himself said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through him. That's the authoritative, written, declared word of God. I pray, Father, for your work to be done in all of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.